and thank you for joining me for this first of a five-part video series called Lamenting in God's Embrace. These videos will explore spiritual disciplines that have been assigned to a company each week of Lent 2021 for Foundry United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. The disciplines, structured around and in our 2021 Lenten devotional, lead the practitioner through various exercises or disciplines designed to deepen their understanding and experience of lament. My name is Will Ed Green, and I currently serve as Foundry's Associate Pastor and Director of Discipleship. My goal in each of these videos is to provide you with both a scriptural and theological background for each week's assigned discipline, as well as basic instructions for how to practice that discipline yourself. In our first video, we'll explore the importance of knowing your spiritual autobiography and living a well-examined life. Starting in the book of Genesis, Scripture emphasizes the importance of our memory for teaching, reproof, sustaining our work and witness, and empowering new generations to take their place in the story of God's love. One of my favorite examples of this is found in the book of 2 Timothy. Purportedly written by Paul to one of his favorite protégés, the letter attempts to encourage the young leader in his ministry. Paul begins the letter early on with an admonition that Timothy remember and recall the spiritual formation of his youth and the persons important in it. He says that Timothy should rekindle the gift of God that is within him from the laying on of hands. For God did not give him a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Paul reminds Timothy that his memory is not only a source of strength by which he might more fully and faithfully live into the future, but that his memory is also a living expression of God's power, presence, and call. This is nothing new for Scripture. In both the Hebrew Bible and New Testament, God's commandment to remember is one through which the people, both individually and collectively, become who God calls them to be. Now, it may seem strange to think of memory as something which is necessary for our becoming, right? It's easy to think of our memories as nothing more than nostalgia for bygone days, or fodder by which we prepare ourselves or protect ourselves for some unknown future. But the scriptural commandment to remember is something altogether different. When we're talking about this kind of sacred memory, what we mean is the mutually maintained and communally reinforced identity of God's people. It is our memory, you see, of both personal and corporate moments in which God's intervention, protection, or providence becomes real, that we become able to anticipate God's interruption, intervention, or invitation to deeper discipleship in our own lives. Recalling God's faithfulness in the past is important not because it reminds us of good times gone by, but because it increases our awareness of and openness to God's continuing revelation in the future. As early as Genesis chapter 9, God's memory preserves not only people's past actions, in this case the sinfulness leading to the flood, but a commitment on God's part to never forget or forsake God's people. In this instance, the divine memory is not a dusty card catalog of things gone wrong or glory days gone by, but a living expression of God's love in the present and the future. In the Torah and the Psalms, the people are regularly commanded or reminded to remember God's previous expressions of faithfulness or intervention on their behalf as a way of anticipating God's future action in the world. Their memory, whether in moments of joy or moments of lament, re-enlivens both their understanding of God's presence with them in the current moment and the promise of God's continuing presence with them, even as they face an unknown future. In fact, we find that the word remember occurs 125 times in the Hebrew Bible and 34 times in the New Testament. Festivals, liturgical celebrations, and community rhythms are built around the people's sacred responsibility to preserve memory. So what does this mean for us today? It means in part that we have a responsibility and a divine call to practice sacred memory as a part of our discipleship journey. So what are some of the ways that we do that, perhaps without knowing? Individual practices of memory include things like prayer, in which we actively give thanks for God's providence and protection and seek God's intervention because of our memory of those events for which we give thanks in our lives. 
journaling, in which we over long periods of time are able to observe, acknowledge, and recall times throughout our days, and weeks in which God's presence becomes real or is made known, offering witness or testimony through which we leverage our own experience of God's faithfulness to help us explore other ways that God might be faithful to us or places in which we might encounter God's presence in the world. And small group and learning communities in which as we develop authentic, vulnerable, and real relationships with people, they are able to help us remember the places where we have encountered God and we are able in turn to be that same kind of living memory for them. Communal practices of memory are equally rich. Written memory in the forms of hymns, scripture, and spoken liturgy keep us connected to the people of God throughout history and offer their experiences as ways through which we may too encounter God's presence. Memory embodied in the architecture of our places of worship and ritual moments like receiving the communion elements or feeling the touch of water on our heads as we remember our baptism make real memories which might only be possible through the memory of others. And an active memory through which in our pursuit of mercy and justice, regular worship and other communal gatherings today, we recall through stories shared and opportunities accepted, God's faithfulness and love on behalf of all God's people. Notice here that both kinds of memory are important and that neither takes precedence over the other. Whether we have a long lasting and clear memory or a fleeting and failing one, these various practices of sacred memory create space for all people to recall and participate in this kind of vital memory through which God's people both find their place and the faith necessary to continue doing God's work in the world. As we begin our Lenten journey, focusing on lament and its role in the spiritual life, this kind of memory is critical. Lament has always been, in part, an invitation to integrate the broken, painful, and otherwise disintegrated parts of our lives into a cohesive whole held together by God's love. In a culture and in a world in which we're taught to fear our feelings, lament allows a concrete expression of our pain and creates space for God to enter those painful moments and begin the work of healing and helping us step into new life. Lament is a critical part of our Christian story, our spiritual autobiography, because it is through the lens of our lament that we become most aware of and intimately familiar with God's loving presence in our lives and God's desire to be a part of both our joy and our sorrow. That's why this week, we're inviting you to write your own spiritual autobiography. So what is a spiritual autobiography? A spiritual autobiography is an attempt, an opportunity, for you to sit together with spirit and to tell your own God story. Starting from your earliest memories of encountering God's love, the process invites you to explore the parts of your personal spiritual journey you may have forgotten, offers you an opportunity to consider the ways you've grown in relationship with God and others as a disciple, and provides a space to consider alternative modes of encountering listening for or discerning God's presence to what currently might be most comfortable or familiar to you. Ultimately, a spiritual autobiography is a chance to honestly explore your faith and doubt, your hope and hopelessness, your joy and your lament. Now this may feel daunting, so note that a spiritual autobiography is not a comprehensive catalog of every moment of your Christian journey nor is it an opportunity to rewrite that story in a more favorable or comfortable light, a game of winning or losing the game of best Christian of the year, or the definitive narrative of your discipleship journey. It is an opportunity rather to pause in the present moment and given all that you're currently holding or experiencing, reflect about how what you have gone through might inform how you show up for what is next. There's no one right way to write a spiritual autobiography. However, we've offered some instructions to help you get started on your own process. Begin by setting aside 45 to 60 minutes in a quiet place to write. Begin with prayer and invite God to be with you as you reflect. Now, think about the places and ways you first heard about God. Was it through church? 
a family member or friend? Where were you when you heard that good news? Who was involved? And was it a positive or a negative experience? Was the news in fact good or not? Where in moments of your life have you felt especially close to God? And what was happening and who was involved in those moments? Where have you felt distant from God? And what was happening in your life then? Who were the main characters? Now, consider moments where you've experienced deep trust in or awareness of God's presence. What does it feel like where you have had moments of doubt or resentment toward God? Pause to think about where you are right now. What do you not have? that you need? And what does that need say about your present spiritual state? What is it that you do need in order to make your next steps on the journey? And finally, conclude your time of writing with prayer, thanking God for being with you up to this point and inviting God to help you have whatever it is you need to continue this journey through Lent and beyond. The gift of memory, the call to remember, is one of the church's greatest gifts. As we enter this Lenten season, let me offer you this invitation then to step back, reflect, and remember as an individual and together with those with whom you're studying. All those places where you've been closest, closest to and farthest from God. And then, as we continue learning about and exploring the work of lament together, let that memory be for you a source of strength, hope, and awareness about where God might be calling you next. As always, remember that God loves you, that we love you, be gentle with yourselves, and keep on the journey of discipleship.